Again, good morning, friends. Um, we've shared with the boys and girls a little bit of the story uh, of the resurrection of Jesus and the response of Thomas. But we come this morning to look at this uh, continuing passage in the book of Ruth. But as we begin this morning, I'm very conscious that it has been a, a challenging week again for many, stuck in their homes and coping with everything that's going on. And also at the, at the really sad loss of Molly, and uh, we just remember Florence and David and James and Anise uh, in Canada and the whole family because we have lost one of our great stalwarts in the congregation, a lovely, lovely lady who loved her Lord and who served him faithfully within this congregation. And we just commend them all uh, into God's hands in these days and many others who, who are just being, who are facing challenging, challenging days. We give thanks that Roy McKee is home very weak uh, and we pray for him that God would just be close to him and bless him in these days but we want to turn to God's word and as we do just let's still our minds and our hearts as we come before God loving father as we come to you we are very aware that you know everything about us that you are the sovereign God Uh, you're the alpha and the omega the beginning and end of all things and you know every detail of our lives and for that we praise you And we ask this morning, loving Father, that you'll be amongst us as we turn to your word. We pray for our friends and families who are going through challenging times. We give thanks for your saints now called home to glory. But we also pray that you will be amongst us as your people in these days. Encourage our hearts that we indeed might be true witnesses for Jesus Christ. That others will see and know that he is Lord of all that we are and of all that we seek to do. Bless us as we turn to your word. Guide our thoughts and our understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I read just a few verses from the book of Ruth uh, and chapter 2? And we're reading from uh, verse 4. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted his harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of the harvesters, whose young woman is this? The foreman replied, she is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among you sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the fields and worked steadily from morning till night, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this she bowed down with her face to the ground and she exclaimed, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know about. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ending there in verse 12, and we thank God for his word. Last Sunday morning, I, I, I reminded us that where we should have been in our studies was to think about this man, Boaz, and think about him as the right man and at the right time. Another title could be Boaz Comes to the Rescue. If you were to make a list of some of the great men of Scripture, you would probably include in that list Abraham, the father of the nations, David, that great psalmist and king, Moses, who led the people up out of Egypt, Daniel, who prayed daily three times and who lived a great testimony for the Lord. But I'm not sure that you would have actually considered putting Boaz in that great list. But the truth is, he deserves to be there because he was God's man at the right time to fulfill God's plan and God's purposes. And in many ways, He displays wonderful characteristics. And I I don't think I'm stretching the analogy when he presents for us a picture of Jesus. Because like Jesus, Boaz finds the outcast. The story of Boaz's introduction into this book, a very short book, 
It tells us that he came down from Bethlehem, down to the field. We understood the last time we talked about how that this was a big open place and it was subdivided into sections and it was marked by, by stones and Boaz owned a section of this huge field uh, and it was his to, to harvest. But he comes down and he, he greets his workers and he says, the Lord be with you. And the first introduction about Boaz is that we, we get this, this understanding that he was a godly man who had a heart for the Lord and who had a care for the welfare, the spiritual welfare of his servants. The Lord be with you. But then the second thing that we notice, who is this woman? He, he looks around the women that were working in the field and the men were in the field and he notices a stranger. Who is this woman? He knows about her when the foremen tell her that this is, Naomi, this is Ruth, the, the foreigner come from Moab living with Naomi. He knows about her. It's a small village, Bethlehem, and it would have been common knowledge who this woman was. But it appears that he never had met her before. He had heard all about her, but he had never met her. He had never seen her. And there was something about Ruth that, 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 that stirred his heart. There was an attractiveness about Ruth. Now, we're told nothing about her physical appearance. So it, it, it must, we must assume that it was simply because of the very nature that she had that, that, that Boaz was attracted to her. And we see him giving a, a series of instructions to her to be careful and, 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 and to, to be provided for. And I want to think about her story and his story under three he head headings. The first is Boaz's problem. Here was a woman, a foreigner from Moab. Now, we're told that in, in the scriptures, right through the scriptures, that Moab was a sworn enemy of Israel. Indeed, the instruction given in Deuteronomy was that there was to be no intermarriage. There was to no, be no mingling of nations, that they were to be a separate people, and certainly they were never to consider any association with Moab. And yet we here, here have Moab, Boaz finding himself in the company of a sworn enemy. And for him, that was a problem. Or it didn't appear to be a problem because here was a woman in need. And he was attracted to her and he sought to make some help and assistance to her at that moment. He had a problem. And in many ways, it's the same problem that, that God has for mankind. And again, I'm not, I don't believe I'm stretching the analogy in that where the scriptures tell us that we were strangers and enemies to God. Yet in that enmity between God, between man and God, we're told that God reaches out in love. God has a compassion and a passion for mankind. Just as Boaz looked on this woman, he called her daughter. There was a term of affection. There was a, 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 a terms of concern. Just as God looks on us and he loves us and he is concerned for us, but there's a problem. There's that great gulf. There's that enmity between us. But then the second thing that I want you to note this morning is that Boaz afforded her protection. He, he, he was well aware of the situation. Here was a woman who was a foreigner, a migrant into the community in which she lived. She was a sworn enemy of Israel. And there would have been many reasons why that she could have been abused and misused within that community. She was seen as nothing more than dirt under the feet of the men of the city. She could well have been physically and sexually abused by those in the city because she was fair game. She was, she was a, a Moabite. She was an enemy. But yet we're told that Boaz afforded her to protection. She said, he said, stay in this field. Stay in this field. And he gave instruction to the men in the field to watch for her, to be careful for her, to make sure nothing happened to her. In other words, he, he, was an, he, he was affording his authority across that whole company of men and gleaners in the field to say, look, this is my friend. This is someone I have a concern for. You look after them just as you would look after me. You know, we have a wonderful God who affords to us his protection. Under the shadow of the Almighty, we rest and we journey. 
And indeed, we, we, we are afforded that protection, particularly when we trust in him. Isn't that what the psalmist David said? Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me and mine enemies. God protects us. Yes, God is a problem, just as Boaz had a problem. We are enemies to God. And God desires to protect us. He provide, he, He's prepared to, 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 to make for us uh, a, a means of, of our protection. But I think more than anything in this passage, we, we see Boaz in terms of Jesus making a provision. Making a provision. He does two things. First of all, he, he provides for her when she's thirsty and he provides for her when she's hungry. Now, he's going right across the culture here because he says to Ruth, he said, look, when you're thirsty, go and drink from the water pots that the men have filled. Now, water, uh, women would not normally drink from the water pots that men fill because it would normally be the woman's job to, to, to gather the water. But here, Boaz is saying to her, look, the men have gathered the water. You go and drink. You help yourself. When you're thirsty, make sure that that thirst is satisfied from the water that has been drawn from my well by my man. In many ways, Jesus is telling us, just as Boaz reveals to us, that he alone is the one to satisfy the thirst of our soul. Isn't that what he, he said to the woman of Samaria when she was drawing water? He said, I have water that you know not of that will quench the thirst of your soul. And we know that living water is Jesus Christ, who alone can satisfy and quench the thirst of our lives and our hearts and our souls. And the second thing is the provision of food. He said, don't worry about your food. He said, follow behind my gleaners, gather up what, what you can gather up. And, and he said, in fact, look, what I want you to do is come and sit at my table. Now, again, that was against all of the cultural norms of the day. Normally, it w women would not sit at the table with the master of the house. It was their job to serve. It was their job to eat after everyone else had eaten. But Boaz says, look, come and sit at my table. And indeed, she enjoyed the benefits and blessings she ate to her fill. And so when, when she actually left the company of Boaz and returned home, we're told that she carried with her something like 30 or 40 pounds of barley. And she also carried with her, a, a, if you like, a doggy bag for, for a wonderful a cultural phrase. She brought home some of the food that was on the table, the roasted barley, so that Naomi could be fed as well. What a picture of God's provision through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the living water. I am the bread of life. I am the one that can satisfy. And friends, this morning, if we know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, we, not, we have that provision. And because of that provision, we have that protection. We can fear nothing, even in the midst of all the darkness and difficulties of our day. He is watching over us. And the problem's been solved. Because those who were once enemies are now brought close through Jesus Christ. Yes, Boaz is an example of the Lord Jesus. Ruth represents all of us. Paul, writing to the Romans, reminds, reminds us, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For we have all sinned and have all fallen short of the glory of God. There is no difference between rich and poor, no difference between young and old, no difference between male and female, no difference between Jew and Moabite. Boaz understood the truth, even if his Jewish neighbors didn't. He intended to include Ruth in his family, even if his friends thought he was doing wrong. This is what grace looks like. We all stand condemned by our sin. All of us are under the judgment of God. We sin in different ways. We are sinners nonetheless. Boaz points us to the grace of our Lord Jesus, who died to redeem men and women through his blood. 
Boaz is an admirable man, a godly man. But that's not the main message of the story. We are just like Ruth. We are outsiders to God's grace. We have no claim on the Lord, just as Boaz provided what Ruth needed but did not deserve. The Lord Jesus comes to us and opens up the door of heaven. He came for sinners who have no hope of forgiveness. And we are sinners, yes. We are condemned, yes. Is there hope? Yes. Ruth could do nothing but accept the kindness of Boaz. The only thing we can do with grace is receive it. Either we come to God with empty hands or we don't come at all. Ruth ate all that she she wanted and had plenty left over to take home to Naomi. That's how grace works. We never run out of grace. Grace comes to us like the barley came to Ruth. She had all she could eat with plenty to share. God never runs out of grace. Sin takes its bitter toll. Sin robs us of our dignity and destroys our joy. In Jesus, we are fed and clothed. In Jesus, we find a home and a family. Whatever we need, we find in Jesus who is, the, who is greater than Boaz. Like Ruth, we have no claim on him, no reason to hope. But the cross of Jesus, we find, in the cross of Jesus, we find the favor of God poured out on us as sinners. Jesus' blood is more than enough for the needy, needy sinners like you and me. That's how grace works. And what great news the story of Boaz and Ruth bring to us this morning that there is hope for all of us in darkness and sin as we trust in Jesus. I trust in this incoming week the Lord will bless you, watch over you and care for each of you and that we'll be able to join together again next Sunday morning in worship and in praise of our God. Let us pray together. Loving Father, we just thank you again today for the opportunity of meeting in your house and meeting in our homes and sharing together around your word. We pray, Lord, that it will become a living word in all our hearts as we trust in you. Lord, as we go forward into this in this coming week, we thank you that the problem of our sin has been dealt with through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wonderful protection that is ours through the Savior who watches over and cares for us. And we thank you for that wonderful provision that you meet all our needs according to your great riches and glory. Lord, bless us as your people. Guard us and keep us. And we pray now that your grace, your mercy, and your peace will be our portion today and forevermore. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Blessings to you all.